If you grew up in American evangelical fundamentalism like I did, you know all the Bible stories we were taught from Sunday school on through to big church. From Christmas pageants to Bible class at a private Christian school, we were taught how Eve ate the apple offered by Satan in the form of a serpent, how the animals came to Noah's Ark two by two, how Mary rode a donkey to Bethlehem to give birth to Jesus, how three wise men named Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar brought baby Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh, how Satan is the ruler of hell, how being gay is absolutely a sin, and that the Bible is strictly anti-abortion. What if I told you, though, that none of these things are actually found inside the Bible? Welcome back to Assigned Christian at Birth. I'm Andy, and my pronouns are they, them. I've had a lot going on in my personal life lately involving a sick dog, our other partner moving in with us, and the major ADHD medication shortage going on in our country, but I'm back today with a quick and dirty mini-sode where I'll cover a handful of story elements I was taught were in the Bible. However, upon diving deeper into actual biblical scholarship and the history of Christianity, I've discovered just aren't there. As always, please give this video a like and leave me a comment telling me which part of the video is most interesting to you. I'll be back with regular Morning Thoughts episodes in April, but for now, sit back, relax, and prepare to be shooketh, especially if you were raised within the confines of evangelical fundamentalism like I was. Not today, Satan. Not today. One of the foundational Bible stories found in the Tanakh, which Christians, of course, call the Old Testament, is the story of the fall of Adam and Eve. We'll leave aside any arguments about whether or not the world was created the way the text of Genesis says, and for now we're just going to address a particular aspect of the story. In evangelical fundamentalist retellings of the fall, the serpent that tempted Eve has always been identified as Satan. This is such a common teaching that many evangelicals have never bothered to check the text to verify this. In my copy of the Tanakh called the Jewish Study Bible, Genesis 3.1 reads, Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild beasts that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The study notes in that Bible tagged to this part of the story tell us that unlike some later Jewish and Christian literature, Genesis does not identify the talking snake with Satan or any other demonic being. In an article for biblicalarchaeology.com, Shauna Delansky explains that the concept of the devil hadn't even been invented yet yet when the Genesis creation and Eden stories were written. She says, The worldview of Jewish readers of Genesis 2 and 3 profoundly changed in the centuries since the story was first written. After the canon of the Hebrew Bible closed, beliefs in angels, demons, and a final apocalyptic battle arose into a divided and turbulent Jewish community. In light of this impending end, many turned to a renewed understanding of the beginning, and the Garden of Eden was reread and rewritten to reflect the changing ideas of a changed world. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. Speaking of evangelical fundamentalist traditional retellings of stories in the book of Genesis, let's take a quick peek into the story of Noah. For my entire life, in every Sunday school class, Bible study, and Christian school class, we only ever addressed the animals coming to Noah's Ark in pairs. Genesis 7-8 states, Of the clean animals, of the animals that are not clean, of the birds, and of everything that creeps on the ground, two of each, male and female, came to Noah into the Ark as God had commanded Noah. So we can all agree that this verse clearly states that both the clean and unclean animals came two by two, yes? But what about the information found only six verses prior to that? How the heck was this never addressed? Genesis 7-2 says, Of every clean animal you shall take seven pairs, males and their mates, and of every animal that is not clean, two, a male and its mate. How does this verse found so close to Genesis 7-8 completely contradict the idea of two by two? It clearly says here that for clean animals there were seven pairs, and for the unclean animals, there were only two. Mary, did you know? One of the quintessential images of Christmas is the Virgin Mary riding a donkey led by Joseph on their trek to Bethlehem for the census mentioned in Luke. Unfortunately, there's no mention of Mary traveling in this fashion. My copy of the Greek-English Interlinear New Testament says in Luke 2, 4 through 6, Now went up also Joseph from Galilee, from city of Nazareth to Judea, to city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of house and lineage of David, to register with Mary, the one engaged to him, being pregnant. And it came about while they were there, were fulfilled the days, her to bear. There's absolutely no mention of how they traveled on this supposed trip. 
So where did this famous image come from? There's a non-canonical gospel called the Proto-Evangelium of James, where the church actually gets a lot of its traditional Christmas imagery. While the canonical gospels all differ greatly and often don't agree or line up on many aspects of Jesus' life, the infancy gospel of James describes Joseph as Mary's guardian, not her husband. He's a widower with sons from his marriage, one of whom is James, the one this gospel is named for, and the person who supposedly actually led the donkey. While this gospel doesn't have the traditional separation of chapter and verse, I did include a link in the description where you can read it for yourself. The following can be found in paragraph 17. The beginning of the trip to Bethlehem starts with, And he saddled the ass and set her upon it, and his son led it, and Joseph followed. And the end of paragraph 17 reads as follows, And they came into the middle of the road, and Mary said to him, Take me down from off the ass, for that which is in me presses to come forth. And he took her down off the ass, and said to her, Whither shall I lead thee, and cover thy disgrace? For this place is desert. The story of the wise men only appears in the book of Matthew, and while the book does detail that three gifts were given, it never says that there were only three magi. The Greek-English interlinear New Testament says in Matthew 2.1, Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in days of Herod the king. Look, magi from east arrived in Jerusalem. The biblical magi page of Wikipedia also tells us that while Western Christianity has traditionally assumed that there were three wise men corresponding with the three gifts, Eastern Orthodox Christianity often count the number of wise men as 12. As far as the identities and names of the three wise men as understood within Western Christianity, it turns out that the names Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar did not appear in relation to the wise men until an 8th century religious chronicle, which was a Latin translation of a lost Greek manuscript probably composed in Alexandria roughly two centuries earlier. Additionally, the name Caspar specifically is attributed to another non-canonical text, the Apocryphal Acts of Thomas. The wiki tells us that the single biblical account in Matthew 2 simply presents an event at an unspecified point after Christ's birth in which an unnumbered party of unnamed wise men visits him in a house, not a stable. Hey! You are the devil and the devil is bad. Hey! You are the devil and the devil is bad. Hey! You are the devil and you are bad. The common teaching in evangelical fundamentalism about Satan's role in the great cosmic divide between heaven and hell is that he is both the ruler of hell and the one who will issue eternal torments to those who end up there. It was mind-blowing to me when I learned what most fundamentalist Christians believe today about heaven and hell is not based on biblical text or even early Christian theology, but instead is mostly based on a poem. An article about Satan on History.com says that perhaps the most lasting images of the devil are associated with hell, which the Bible refers to as a place of everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Still, the Bible doesn't state that the devil will reign over hell, just that he'll eventually be banished there. The idea that the devil governs hell may have come from a poet by Dante Alighieri, The Divine Comedy, published in the early 14th century. Revelation 2.10 says that Satan is cast into hell, not that he will rule over it. While we know today that Revelation was written as a metaphor and is connected to events that have already transpired in history, it's a common fundamentalist belief that the book is a prophetic reckoning of what we should all expect to literally happen in the end times. The Greek-English Interlinear New Testament says in Revelation 20.10, And the devil, the one deceiving them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where both the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night into the ages of the ages. Let's get down to business. All right, let's just get down to the facts on this one. Obviously, we know evangelical fundamentalism claims that the Bible says being gay is a sin. And honestly, I can't fault most of those churchgoers for thinking that's the case because it's what they've been told for years and years and years. It's also what the Bibles they use say. Whether it's the KJV or the NIV, yes, there are verses that condemn being gay. But where did the KJV and the NIV evolve from? And why are typical churchgoers uninterested in investigating what was written in the original text? Why are they uninterested in reading translations that were created between then and now. German Bibles from the 1800s would likely shock most American non-denominational and Baptist churchgoers. In an interview with a member of a research team who has extensively investigated what the Bible actually says about homosexuality, the researcher Ed Oxford tells us, in the English where it says man shall not lie with man for it is an abomination, the German version says, Man shall not lie with young boys as he does with a woman, for it is an abomination. He goes on to say, 
Then we went to Leviticus 20.13, same thing, young boys. So we went to 1 Corinthians to see how they translated arsenokoitai. Instead of homosexuals, it said, boy molesters will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've included the transcript of the interview in the description below, and I encourage you all to go read it. Ed even talks about how Martin Luther's translation of the Bible says boy molesters, not homosexuals, and discusses how the American church actually paid for the expensive changes in translation within the German Bible in order to make it say homosexual instead of boy molester. If anyone has a gay agenda, it's American Christians. As far as American evangelicals believe, both God and the Bible have always been anti-abortion, and since Jerry Falwell's moral majority of the 1980s, the issue of pro-life versus pro-choice has been the catalyst for getting evangelical fundamentalists involved in American politics as a tactic to push Christian dominionism. There are plenty of Bible verses used by American Christians to claim that the text is talking about abortion, such as Psalm 139.13, which in the Jewish study Bible reads, it was you who created my conscience, you fashioned me in my mother's womb. Or Jeremiah 1.5, which says, before I created you in the womb, I selected you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet concerning the nations. This verse is specifically about the commissioning of Jeremiah. If we were to read this verse as an absolute historical truth, it's clear that it's about a specific person at a specific time in history. If God is all-knowing, Obviously, he knew Jeremiah was going to be this prophet. He would know ahead of time if Jeremiah's mother was going to have a miscarriage or if an abortive procedure would take place. Bad faith arguments by Christians about, what if you abort the next great leader or inventor, nullify their own belief system when they claim to believe that God knows everything that will ever happen. Why would God assign that to a fetus involved in a non-viable pregnancy? It just does not make sense. And we haven't even addressed Numbers 5, 11 through 31. I won't quote the entire thing here, but I encourage you to go read it, especially the version found in the Jewish Study Bible, the English translation closest to the original language in which the text was written. Numbers 5, 23 through 24 says, The priest shall put these curses down in writing and rub it off into the water of bitterness. He is to make the woman drink the water of bitterness that induces the spell so that the spell-inducing water may enter into her to bring on bitterness. Many scholars have read this as a medically induced abortion, saying that the gruesome priestly purity test to which a wife accused of adultery must submit will cause her to abort the fetus if she is guilty, indicating that the fetus does not possess a right to life. Who came up with this test? The Lord. And when did he say it? Directly to Moses in verse 11. Thank you so much for being here with me today for this mini-sode. I hope you've learned something or at least found a jumping off point for your own personal study. If you've gained knowledge from my work or believe the work I'm doing is important, would you consider financially supporting my scholarship and my channel over at buymeacoffee.com slash assigned X-T-I-A-N? Every dollar donated goes toward me being able to continue my work and to help take care of my family. Talk to you all soon, ACAB fam. Okay, bye!